Welcome back to On Texas Football, a little special Saturday edition of the Longhorn live stream. I'm CJ Vogel, joined by Lifetime Longhorns, Rod Babers and Bobby Burton. Hey, we got a fun show today, guys. We got a really fun show today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the, the Longhorn teams of past. It obviously starts and stems from the college football playoff expanding to 12 teams and eventually 14. We might even see 16 before it's all, uh, you know, all said and done eventually, but this will be a fun one. And uh, guys, I, I wanted to get your thoughts because it's been in the news recently again, the expanded playoff. Bobby, I'll start with you. What do you think of it? What do you make of the playoff continually adding teams before even really getting an idea of what it'll it'll look like at 12? You know, my my take on it, CJ, and, and first of all, I, I thanks for joining us on a Saturday afternoon. We thought we'd do something a little, switch it up, uh, do something a little different today for fun. Um, you know, I think that uh, – this, the 16 versus 14 versus 12. It's going to be 12 no matter what. They're going to inc increase it to 14 to make sure at least three SEC teams and three Big Ten teams make the playoffs each and every year. If they take it to 16, those two conferences are going to ask for four. Mm -hmm. And they should. They'll be half the playoff. They represent more than half the good teams, in my opinion. Yep. Um, and so I'm really looking to see when it goes to 16 – how this all breaks out because if they go to 16, I don't even, that's where I think you should just buckle down and eliminate the ACC and add the teams from the big 12 that want to really play for it. Because that, that's my take on it right now. Is it that, you know, the, the big 12 and the ACC are clearly going to be behind the SEC in the, in the big 10. So how do you, how do you account for that appropriately? And I'm not sure you can, just when it's three to two, that's not, that's not an appropriate number. It's more like two to one, right? So four teams versus two. Rod, what, Rod, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious, um, right. That the big 10, the sec are going to offer up the best product. Uh, and that's what this is about. This is about offering up the best television product so that college football now can get the most eyeballs and get the biggest ratings so they can produce the most revenue. That's ultimately what this is about, especially with this is the college football playoff. It's going to when it goes when it goes to you know, 14, 16, when it keeps expanding, because we are we're a value sized society. So we're going to keep on making this thing get bigger because I think it is actually going to get huge ratings. It's going to be really successful, which means it's going to make a lot more money. Uh, they're gonna go. They're gonna go head to head with the NFL at one point because the NFL usually takes over those Saturdays after college football is done. Well, college football now is expanding its season, and the NFL is saying, "Hey, man, we still want to take them Saturdays, so we're gonna take it." So, actually, at one point, the NFL and college football and the best of college football is gonna go head to head with the number one television product in America of the hundred most watched television programs in 2023. Ninety three of them were NFL games. Three of them. What college football games? College football wants to change that, and I think they will. I think college football will double the amount of most most watched programs they've had uh, on that list in 2024, just because of the college football playoff alone. I really do think they'll they'll do that. Now, are they going to contend with the NFL? That's not going to happen. Uh, it will be interesting to see that that head to head battle that happens on that later Saturday when the NFL still decides, hey, man, we're going to put our product on Saturday too. Now, maybe it's streaming and they don't have to really worry about that. But it's interesting that that this uh, newer version of college football is all about putting the best brands, up, the biggest and the best brands up against the biggest and the most recognizable brands. That's what yeah. they want to do. And I'm, that's what the I'm, college football playoff is all about. Rod, I, I completely agree with you. I read an article uh, from The Athletic, I believe it was, uh, about uh, the fact that, Roger Goodell's not just because college football is going to try to take back Saturdays in January. Roger Goodell's really not having any of it. Nope. He's not he's not planning to change <laughs> any of his uh, comments or way the way he goes about it. So they are going to have competition. Here's my question: I mean, why does it? Why don't they stake out a Tuesday or Thursday for college football? You know, they, it doesn't have to. They don't play last year's championship. Was it on a Sunday or was it on a? I mean. Texas That's didn't necessarily point. play on a Sunday for the national champion. I mean, my point being, it usually ties in with the national bowl games. So you could actually start it where it, it doesn't have to hit on a weekend. But I'm guessing that uh, they kind of want college fans to travel with their team. And that's usually going to be over a weekend. There you, you know? go. Good point. I mean, Great point. So that's where the, the hang up might be. But I'm telling you, your team's in the national championship game. Texas fans are going to travel. It, it doesn't yeah. really. 
it, the game could be on Wednesday at 9 a.m. They're traveling. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, the boss, the boss is going too, Bobby. All of them going. Now everybody yeah, in the exactly. company is going. Is that it's twice all right? I kind of <laughs> all I know is that month of December is about to be very fun for college football fans, football fans in general. I don't know if y'all have seen the tweets or the schedules of what those games will look like with the playoffs loading up. Uh, we talk about March Madness, you know, about to start up with the conference tournaments and 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 yeah. the big tournament going as well. But when you sit back down and this winter and look at that schedule of college football playoff games. NFL playoff games and everything that matters uh, on the gridiron for both sides. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and especially for the teams that are in the college football playoff, because ESPN reported yesterday, Heather Dinich and uh, Pete Thamel, the payouts for the college football playoff teams are getting significantly higher for teams in the SEC and the eight, or in the big 12 or big 10, excuse me, uh, $21 yep. million payouts just for making the college football playoff. That's a lot of money, especially when you yeah, add in the fact how much these teams are making already uh, for their media rights deals. You're looking at a hefty chunk of change already, uh, and it's only going to continue adding to the kind of the change in, in landscape that we're seeing right now. When it, when you talk about the rich getting richer with the NIL, now TV rights and the college football playoff adding to the pot. Bobby, I mean, <laughs> another 21 mil after a season you had last year for Texas, it, it would have made substantial change moving mm -hmm. forward. I that's a 21 mil versus five. That's not, that's not a small increase. I mean, you're not going no. from 5 million to 5.5 million. You're going, <laughs> that's, that's an extra $16 million. Yeah. I mean, that pays for every other sport just right. for scholarships. I mean, every other athlete on campus is then taken care of. If you, if you make the college football playoffs. Yeah. yeah. It, that's how big that number is. And I'm not saying, that's why college football, in, in my opinion, needs to break off from the NCAA. They shouldn't be governed, in my opinion, by the same folks. I mean, you know, the term, this is, it's not amateur athletics, Rod and CJ, that we really are talking about, that I think has some fundamental value to folks. It's not, it's not that. It's what we call Olympic sports. Mm -hmm. That has value. Like, it's not so much that, Texas softball players are amateurs. That doesn't really matter to me. And, and, I, and I say this the wrong way, maybe, but what I'm getting at is the fact that it's an Olympic sport, that does have intrinsic value to the nation. It creates a, a value of what's going on there and what we can get out of it. You know what I mean? As a, as a country and as a group, I think that, that that's how they need to position NCAA is Olympic sports visa instead of just all non-revenue sports um, or all, all sports together. Take football out of it. Take basketball out of it. Even though it's a, even though it is a Olympic sport, you, you guys know what I'm getting at here. Yeah. Instead of categorizing as NCAA is completely amateur, it doesn't have to be amateur. Make it Olympic. Make some of them yeah. Olympic and separate from there and figure it out. I think that gives them a, a chance. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good point. Uh, before we get into what we want to talk about today, which is going to be very fun when we go back the last 25 years or so in regards to uh, the, the changing play, uh, landscape of college football playoff, how these past Texas teams would have done. Rod, I know you got some some takes you want to get off your chest back in the, uh, the, the <laughs> early 2000s there about some teams that probably would have been in the hunt for a national championship. Uh, I, I mean, let's set the guidelines here just a little bit. Starting at 2000, are we working with Bobby a a 12 team playoff, a 14 team playoff? Does it? There's going to be a a couple times here where that you know those last two spots really come into into factor here. Uh, let's set some guidelines here before we get into the uh, the nitty gritty here. Starting at two, the the 2000 season here. Yeah, I think I think you go with 14. Does that sound right to y'all? That's 14. what it looks like it's going to be. Okay, I think, I think that works fair. for me. That that makes things easy. Um, let's, let's get to it because 2000, yeah. this is an interesting one. It, yeah. I, Texas I finished, think, yeah, go ahead, CJ. Texas finishes nine and three, seven and one in the conference. They got as high in the AP poll as number five. So they stuck around in that ranking, uh, throughout the duration of the season. Uh, Matt Brown really started to figure things out after a nine and five season in 1999, the turn of the millennium. Again, this is really where you start seeing Texas get into that, you know, kind of national presence here. Finish. The AP number 12. 
We think we make that team. They they make the playoff there. Thirty five mm. points per game, top ten offense. Bobby, what do you think? I think mm. I think we should ask Rod B since he was on the team. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll say I, I'll say this. And that, that that was that was a team that surprised a lot of people because the the talent that Mac brought in that ninety nine class. Um, they, 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 they played really early. That was that was me. I was part of that number one recruiting class. They put us on the field really early. A lot of us got probably should have redshirted. Honestly, guys like Sims. Um, hell, even myself, hell, probably Corey Redding probably even could have dealt with a redshirt. Remember, Corey Redding ends up being a D tackle in the league, right? So his body wasn't even done transforming when he got to the 40 acres. He was running down on kickoffs when he first got to Texas. I'm talking about sprinting down, making plays on kickoff as a guy covering kickoffs. So he was he, he had a lot of growing to do, I think. Um, but that was a class that was really talented. So Mac put that class out there, and much like Sark, his his group did a really good job of being able to maximize and develop the talent they inherited and Mac inherited a lot of talent. Hell, not just Ricky Williams. And now they're talking about, you know, 99 and by 2000, when I was there. I mean, hell, we still had a big Mike Williams. Who's a first round pick. We still had a Quentin Jammer on campus. We still had a Casey Hampton, Sean Rogers. Those are guys that Mac didn't recruit. That's guys that Mac inherited. All right. And those are damn good players. So Mac did a really good job of developing those guys and putting those guys in a position to be successful really early on. And then coming behind that he had the young guys like myself he kind of pushed onto the field early on to try to contribute but i mean think about that defensive line you know you got casey hampton and sean rogers on that d line there's a aaron humphrey i think a cedric woodard may have been on that d line back then but that d line was nasty at the time um you know uh so 2000 uh maybe aaron humphrey was gone actually i take that back i think he was gone already but uh i think that 2000 they would have they probably would have lost the first playoff game if they know who they play, I, I don't know. It's a real matchup based situation there. If they if they played the wrong matchup, that team would have got beaten. If it had been the right matchup, it could have been perfect because uh, Hodges Mitchell was highly underrated as a running back too back then. Uh, he ended up getting hurt in the bowl game. Uh, that was that that group. I think it's all about the matchup because we didn't have the talent level. I think overall, but in in pockets, Bobby, that group was really really talented. Yeah, yeah, you lost to Oregon and Jeff Tedford and Joey Harrington in the yep. play, in the uh, in the Holiday Bowl, right? Uh, that was the yep. game that y'all played play in that bowl game. Y'all were nine and two going into that. Um, look, I, the only conference loss you had was to OU, uh, right? And OU played uh, in in one of the big bowls that year. So I, I feel like uh, I feel like Rod, y'all y'all would have been in. Uh, but to your point, I don't, you know, you're the one that was on that team. And for you to sit up here and say, I don't think we would have went deep. That's kind no. of what you're getting at, right? You just, no. maybe we get, we get through the first game, but we don't go deep in that. You just didn't have the horses. But 2001, I think is a yeah, different hey. story. 2001 was a yeah. fun team looking back. And Rada, again, I want to get your thoughts because this is really where you start seeing Miami and the dominant teams that they have take oh, national yeah. college football by storm on the national level. Uh, Texas starts the year preseason top five. Uh, and then we kind of see the snags of playing Oklahoma four or five straight years in a row. You lose in Dallas those years. And that era of college football, that knocks you out of what you would have hoped to have been, uh, uh, at least controlling your own destiny of getting it to the national championship game or in that BCS era of what you would have wanted to be at the end of the season, correct? So, yeah. Interestingly enough, you know, you have a top 10 offense. Your defense really takes a step forward as well. That is a, a team with a lot of dogs right there. Yeah, uh, a late season loss in the Big 12 championship to Colorado. Rod, you talked about this previously, you know, uh, some some late season losses for some of these oh, teams man. that you were on. Is that a, a, a loss looking back on that, you know, <laughs> you, you might look back and say that kept us from playing for a national championship? It did. If there's a playoff back then, I'm telling you, that team – was a damn good team. Now you got to remember that Mac Brown was really hesitant on playing freshmen in starting roles uh, as freshmen. Now he wanted guys who were sophomores in 2000. I was a sophomore. That's why I ended up being a starter then. But he was almost uh, vehemently opposed to it. Like it was like, nah, you're a freshman. You can't play. I don't give a damn how good you are. If you're a prodigy, you know, said Benson comes in and said, Benson is that he's a prodigy. And he didn't play said Benson early on. He made he comes in and spot roles as a complimentary player, but didn't play early on. And then we lose to Oklahoma. And I believe after that, the pressure comes on and Mac decides, all right, you know what? You're not a freshman anymore. You can play 
And I don't know if we got said, be safe. I was, I'm not mistaken. I still think he gets to a thousand yards there without even starting for the first part of the season. And that was really the key that got that offense going. That really took the offense to the level. Uh, defensively, we, man, we were just a, we played man coverage. Carl Bull Reese was a defense squad. We played man coverage, almost exclusively man coverage. And if I'm not mistaken, that's the first year Coach Akina comes in, right? Oh. 2001. And Coach Akina has a brilliant strategy to counter Oklahoma's air raid offense that comes into the Big 12 and takes over. He's like, you know what, man? I just, I need cover guys everywhere. If you can't cover, you can't be in secondary. Because remember, dude, the Big 12 was still, they were still running triple option. Nebraska was still running old school option when I got to the Big 12. <laughs> I'm not joking. Like that was, they were, that was real. They were still running, tw- hell, Texas running 21 personnel with actual fullbacks like Matt Trissel and Chad Stevens. Like it was, Texas should have been running spread personnel, uh, 11 personnel with Roy Williams, B.J. Johnson, Sloan Thomas out there all the time, you know, with a Bo Scaife when he was healthy. And then a, a said Benson, that's what that's what Texas should have been. They weren't actually all the time. That was situational. They were running old school offense. Um, so Coach Aquino was like, no, nah, I just want DBs who can cover. So that's what led to Quentin Jammer going to, to, to move from safety to corner, me playing corner, uh, Mod Brooks moving from corner to safety, Nathan Vasher, who's a corner playing safety. Guys, we could cover. But we was probably the best. Co- I'm not joking. Us in Miami. Go look at Miami secondary. They were legit. We were probably the best covered secondaries in the country. I'm not making that up. That was real. And that's what was, that was the key to that group. 2001 could have won another game. What happened in the Big 12 title game, the Colorado team we had already beaten. Guys, remember, on one play, my man Sims throws a pick. On that pick, Sed Benson and Big Mike Williams are trying to tackle the defender running down there. They smash into one another, knock each other out of the game. Mm. We lose two first-round picks on one play. Uh, in that Colorado two game. top ten picks. Two top ten <laughs> I mean, not those weren't guys; those were dudes. Yeah. You know, the one thing I would say, look, we that team definitely would have been in the playoff and probably would have went far. The question they would have won a game at least. We'd have won well, a game. And but even then, Rod, there was the great debate of Sims versus Applewhite. Hey, we had now, them both. Though. This. You, you had them both, but them both. Bag didn't know which one to play all the time. <laughs> you know, and you know, he even went and played Chris. I think first in the. The, the the no, he didn't play. He, uh, Major came back and won the uh holiday bowl against Washington. Yeah, he did. Yeah, big, he did. big time yeah. comeback. He was yeah. a, a focal point of that, but there's no doubt that that team would have been there. But I still think that the quarterback position was enough that it it, it may have hurt you a little bit there. That that I'm would be that that, that would be you had everything else to your point. You had great receivers, you had great D line, you had great running back, you had everything else. Uh, the 2002 group, and this is where this is where it's funny, CJ. You go to the next group. I, I think you can make an argument that five teams in a row go to the college football play. I really believe that. Uh, that was the thing about Mac Brown. He was yeah. not in that time frame. And, and Rod, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I thought Mac was a very good coach. He was not a great coach during that time frame. He coached a lot not to lose, particularly against OU, I felt like. Um, and then it, it kind of clicked, started clicking 04, 05, primarily because he had Superman at quarterback at times. Yep. But you look at 03, you lose to Washington State in the uh, Holiday Bowl, not Washington, but Washington State. VY kind of has comes out, takes over for Chance Mock. Um, what, what are y'all's thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. you know, and, and where you went from there, because that's a team that I thought had a lot of the pieces to your point, Rod, but wasn't all the way over the top. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think if you look, I like how you said it, they could have made it six years in a row. I mean, you could argue they could have made it more years in a row than that because Texas would have gotten the benefit of the doubt a lot from the yes the selection committee because they would have been on that run and be like, nah, Texas is in. We want Texas in. So I'm with you. I think Texas would have been on a hell of a run. And making yep. the college football play, especially if it was 14, hell, man, they could have got up to six or more, six years in a row or more. Mac would have had a shot in there. The question is, because of your, you're right about this, Bobby. I, I, I love it, man. We got to keep it real. Even when keeping it real goes wrong, you know, Mac Brown's coaching style would have also limited Texas. Because at yep. times, 
Matt played, you know, he coached, excuse me, he coached not to lose. He would coach, uh, you can call it coaching scared at times, whatever you want to call it. Um, there were times where I think Mac would limit his teams. And it wasn't until Vince Young took over uh, that Mac decided, all right, you know what, we're just going to let be a let it be a player-led team. Matter of fact, I'll just kind of get out of the way. I'll let this team go and kind of cruise control, let it regulate itself. I I, I'm, I was good enough to, to recruit these guys, to recruit the right guys, to set the culture. You know what? Now, actually, I think the worst thing I can do is to overcoach this group. Let me just get out of the way and let VY and company do their thing. And I think that was kind of the brilliance of Mac because early on, I would say that Mac was tinkering a little too much with things when I was there. Um, and he probably should have let some of the leaders take over things. Uh, and they were, they were obviously, you talked about an Oklahoma game. There were times when Texas was coaching too conservative. There were some Oklahoma players that at times said, Hey, man, we knew the place uh, they knew <laughs> that were coming up for Texas. Now, now, whether that was because they actually knew the place or Texas was so predictable offensively, which I mean, you can debate that. But so I'm with you. I think uh, Mac, Mac, and he transformed like, like we've seen Sark do, by the way. Since Sark got it, Sark is the same coach he was when he first got it. Sark's different. Sark's coaching differently. He's evolving as a coach. I think we saw Mac evolve um, after, in that mid 2000s from the early 2000s coach. I, I should go back. 2002, they beat LSU. Uh, Roy Williams went wild oh. against uh, LSU. Save it, baby. We be saving. Chris Sims made some money that day, too. Mm-hmm. He, made, he made some money that day. 03 was the loss to Washington State. So 0-2 yeah. was the win in the Cotton Bowl versus LSU. That team would have definitely been in. 3 I don't know if they would have definitely been in, but I think they would have been at 14 teams. What do yep. you what do you think, CJ? Just based on yeah, your no, I, I was gonna ask. Um, going back to 2 Rod, that's another team where in the current system or current uh you know landscape of college football playoff, you're fighting for a bye, right? You you, you yeah. want to get in the top four, kind of make your way uh, around further. That's another season in which you look at a late season loss this time to Cliff Kingsbury, who had probably oh, his man. career day on the field against the Longhorns that day. West Walker Six touchdowns, 473 passing yards. Oh, really, yeah. really helped cement himself as a, 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 a an elite, you know, Big 12 quarterback at the time. Um, I Just real quick, take me through what that last kind of week was like going into, you know, the, 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 Big 12 championship week as well. And, and what was that mindset of the team of, you know, we were a top five team at the time. We lose, you know, we allow a pretty, you know, pretty big outing to Cliff Kingsbury in the DB room, especially. What was that message yeah. from Dwayne Aquino like? No, it was brutal, guys. Uh, in 02, because we had a chance to play it for BCS, uh, playing the BCS championship, or at least be in the BCS game, I should say, uh, and play for the Big 12 championship. Wes Welker, I believe, had over 200 something all purpose yards. Go look back. That was a Cliff Kingsbury had a coming out party, but so did Wes Welker on us. Mm -hmm. And it's because of injuries, guys. We had, we lost. I want to say Nathan Basher went down. uh, Kalen Thornton went down in that game um, at one point. uh, Derek Johnson went down in that game. We had a multitude of injuries. Go back and look. We had at least three or four starters go down in that game at one point. Some came back, but some left and never came back in. We were in Lubbock. It was nighttime. Freaky, crazy things happened. And honestly, I'll blame myself in that game because Wes Welker went off offensively. I can't tell you how many uh, third downs that dude converted. Him and Cliff Kingsbury were in the zone together. It was some Colt McCoy, Jordan Shipley type stuff going on. And I was I was playing the outside corner. A lot of our young DBs were playing because that was those young bucks, young Cedric Griffin, Griffin, young Michael Huff's out there. We had a young group out there. I should have taken. I should have told uh, Coach Akina that I, I was going to nickel. I didn't. I, I watched it happen. I watched the West Welker, you know, come with those little option routes in and out and just abuse Texas. Um, I should have stepped up. I should have. I would have had a better chance to defend them than the Young Bucks. I had played nickel before. I knew how to do it. I should have went in there and did it. I, coach Aquino would have let me do it, too. He trusted me enough. That was my senior year. I'm like, no, nah, let me do it, Coach. I got him. And we didn't do that, and they ate us alive uh, from that slot position. And the thing about it, that was – I heard, Bobby, you talk about this. You wrote an article about it, which was interesting, that that slot, that slot receiver wasn't – it wasn't something that was weaponized until Mike Leach did it. And it was it was around my time when I was a young DB at Texas where he started to weaponize that slot receiver, that that small is quicker than fast uh, slot receiver. And we've seen it over and over again. And that got te- – guys, that was a textbook uh, way to weaponize it against Texas that night. Helped yeah. them win that game, no question. Absolutely. Three years – I want to say this. Three years later – Greg Davis did the same thing to OU in the Cotton Bowl. Or, or five years later, excuse me. Yes. Oh, 
Shipley. Uh, moving J Jordan Shipley from the outside to the inside. Oh. Um, he created exactly. a slot receiver where Jordan could play anywhere uh, as a receiver. He really could. He was intelligent, uh, fast, quick, all of those things. Knew the game inside and out. Uh, but when he made that, OU had no, no answer for it. Nobody. Uh, that's when Texas won 45-35. But it took Texas five years to do that. Shouldn't have, shouldn't have taken so long, you know, exactly. is, is my take. But, but again, those 02, 03 years, 04 is undeniable. 004 is just, I mean, Texas was 11 and 1. Uh, they beat Michigan in the, in the Rose Bowl. The single loss was uh, to OU. Uh, it was a big loss uh, in 20, and 2004. And then that sets up 2005, which frankly was, you know, Texas won the national championship. So yeah. though, I really think over 2000, 2001, 2002, three, four, and five, five years in a row, six years in a row. I think Texas goes to to the championship. And the question is, how often do they win a game? Well, as it's as it's set up today, if we were to look at it in retrospect. The question is, how often do they win a game? Like how often do they win? Like, you know, 05 wins it all. 04, 04 could win make make a run. They could have actually made a run to win it all. I think we agree they, they could win multiple games in the in the playoff. Uh 03. I think they lose potentially in the first round. I don't know if 03 yep. wins it. They're yep. not ready yet. I think 02 wins a game, just one. I think, and I'll be honest, this is my group, all right? I think we win one game. I think that's about it. We were limited, like you talked about, Bobby. I think yep. 01, we win one game because our defense was nasty. I mean, that was a top five defense in the country. It was legit. Um, 2000, we lose in the first round. So that's the question is with how often, how far do these teams go? 05 wins it all, of course. Uh, and then now we're at 06. 06 loses in the first round. Mac Brown didn't even like the 06 team. Mac yeah. Brown, <laughs> I, don't know the, I don't know that the 06, because 05, 2000 to 2005 is actually six years, right? Yeah. 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 And so I think that, I think the 06 team doesn't make it. Okay. You know, they, they were nine and three going in. They beat, it was a rookie or freshman, freshman Colt McCoy. They beat Iowa. Jamal Charles had a great game against Iowa. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I I could see that. But that from then on, you take the next step. I mean, you think set 07 to 09, they're definitely in. That's my and and so you could be talking about nine or ten out of eleven years. Nine out of ten. Yeah. That Texas yeah. would have been in the college fo football playoff. That's why and I go back and say. Texas, even though they didn't win as many national championships as Florida, Texas would have been the team of that decade if they weren't the team of that decade. They would have been in the college football playoff nine out of ten years. And opinion. it's fair to say that would have changed Mac Brown's legacy forever as a college football coach. Because you're right, the perspective, like the the narrative, would be different about if he was making a college football playoff like that every year and then able to make a run to the college yes. football playoff every year. And I would say that you're right about 06, 06. Probably doesn't make it. I think they finished like 13th or something like that. But I think the committee would have given him the benefit of the doubt because of the uh, run they had been on and go, you know what, man, Texas is in. They, that's Texas, baby. They, they, they've been here. They, they've been in the playoff every year for the last six years. They're in. And I think they would have got the benefit of the doubt. So you could argue the run would have still kept going and wouldn't have skipped that one year. And then 07, you're in again. Yeah, there, there are two teams I wanted to touch on just briefly about kind of the narrative that you know, the media plays a big part of when it comes to perception of teams nationally. You know, over the last couple of years, it's always been Alabama, 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 because they've put it on the field. Uh, they've put guys in the league. At the time, Texas in this run, does that reputation precede them and kind of give them that benefit of the doubt? The first team was 2003. They have the you see the kind of spurts of Vince Young, of what he's about to become. A thousand yards rushing that year, really exciting. That running back room at the time, Cedric Benson was really yeah. you know, in his prime then. Uh, the offense, 43 points a game, sixth in the country, high flying running attack again. With where they finish years past, do they get the nod? That's my question for 03 because they do finish 12th or 13th in the AP poll. They're right on the outside looking in. And then 2006 again. Uh, uh, Retro freshman Colt McCoy coming in. I mean, this is a guy who loses to number one Ohio State early in the year. Texas yeah. is still hanging around until probably week nine, ten. Texas loses back to back to A and M and Kansas State. Those are two losses in the back end of that the, the last three weeks of the season. There, 
Is that's that true. too much there that kicks yeah. them out? Cole got hurt. That's true too. Cole got hurt. That's when they they the Aggies came up with the the term cart McCoy because he went off in a cart. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> and wow! With real, class, with real class there. Wow. Um, I don't think they do because if it, I will say this, and, and Rod's right in, in that uh, there would have been some pull media wise to put Texas in because of what they had done the previous number of years, but it took Colt all of that time to get better. Yeah. Okay. In my opinion. I mean, he was not, you, you remember that, Rod. I mean, he was playing with one arm against AM. Yeah. I mean, he really was. Um, and so I, I feel like that. That was a difficult one. It, it almost, CJ, you weren't around at that time, but everybody remembers or knows about the time in the, the Alabama game that he went out with the pinch nerve or whatever happened in his shoulder. Well, the same thing happened to him in uh, in Manhattan that, yep. that week, and he went out and they had to put Jevin Sneed in in the first quarter after Colt ran a, a, a quarterback sneak, by the way. It looked like an innocuous quarterback sneak, just a normal – Remember that ride? It was just like a yep. normal play. He ended up coming out and couldn't play the rest of the game. So I, I look, there, there that 0, 016 was questionable. The rest of the way, that I mean, 07 was in, 08 was in, 09 was in. Those, those were did you I say 07 is for sure? Oh, I think so. Yeah. 10 and 3. You think so? Yeah. I agree. I, yeah. I, I mean, they, even Colt did not have a good sophomore year. One of the biggest surprises, by the way, for those people that weren't around, is Colt's maturity. A lot of people thought he had peaked his freshman year because he had a very mediocre second year. Mm. Would he go like 24 and 10 TD interceptions? Yeah. Um, Rob, does that sound right? Slight yeah. regression. Then, yeah. then he made this unbelievable step, CJ, from his sophomore to his junior year. And he became crazy. the Colt McCoy that we know. Crazy. Very it was like his arm got stronger. It was weird. His arm got stronger. He got stronger. <laughs> more accurate. More accurate. More quicker with the ball. Quicker to make. It was crazy. I mean, all. Oh, I, mean, I asked about 2007 because Texas starts yeah. out top 10 team, top five, suffered back to back losses to Kansas State, in which Colt did not play well. 200 yards, four interceptions, loses to James Johnson and, uh, and Jordy Nelson at the time. So for a, a little sneaky, good Kansas State team. Lose the next week to Oklahoma and Dallas. Now you're sitting in that 19 to, to 17 range in the AP poll. The resume at the time, looking at it here, you played two ranked teams. The first is TCU that you take care of week two. The next is Oklahoma you lose. So you don't get another opportunity to get back to, I guess, resume boosting. Like you say, like you talk about in college basketball, even baseball to an extent. Is that enough there still in your eyes to, to get into a 12-team playoff there? They, they, uh, December 2nd was that final poll. They were 17th. 12 team, no. 14, maybe. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I think no, that's kind of where that the change I comes see, in. Look, yeah, go I, ahead. I see what you're saying. The loss to AM may have pushed them out of it in that in that season. Yeah. The loss to AM may have pushed them out of it. Uh, but they look, I, I feel like a lot of people again. I could say they may have missed in 06 and 07, to your point, and only gone eight of 10 years in that in that decade. I, I'm fine hey, with I that. I hate to be the spoiler of it, but uh, that I'm gonna have. No, I agree with you. We're gonna skip forward to 2010, and I'm gonna be pissed off the rest of this next decade. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least it'll go by fast, Bob, because you'll be like, that team make it. No, that team make it. No, uh, no, we no. Can look at, I mean, there were two what I would call decent teams in that decade. Um, 2012, they, they beat an Oregon State team with David Ash. Yeah. Good team, not a great team. Nine and four. Yeah, but not great. Yeah. And then the 2018 team that that beat Sam Ellinger, beat OU in the Cotton Bowl, then lost in the, the Big 12 championship. They beat Georgia in the, in the Sugar Bowl. But Texas had, I mean, people don't realize this, that, I mean, Texas did not have losing seasons, like, until back in the 50s. Okay? Right. And then they had three in a row. 14, 15, 2014, 15, and 16. Yeah. Um, Charlie Strong really didn't make my high school base fun, I'll tell you that. No, exactly. <laughs> I mean, so, uh, look, we could split the rest of it. 2020, Tom Herman's final year, they went seven and three, but we all know that was kind of a eh, seven and three. 
They beat yeah. a, a, a uh, they were really six and three. And then they played a Colorado team that I think had 20 scholarship players at the time. So, I mean, you know, I, I look at the, the 2000, that aughts or whatever you want to call them and say that was, Rod, you played in it and you started it. It was the golden era of Texas football in some ages. I think the 60s and 70s were as well. Uh, that's a different era, but uh, good stuff overall. Uh, I want to say thanks real quick to one of our sponsors. Then we'll get to a couple questions. We'll talk a little bit more about all these teams that would have made it. 2023 definitely would have been it. They were in it oh. with a four-team yeah. playoff as well. Uh, but I want to say thank you to Laura Baker. Uh, Laura uh, is our friend over at uh, uh, Keller Williams Realty with the Andy Allen team. Uh, Laura has been with us uh, from the get-go. Uh, she has been a tremendous uh, asset for us at On Texas Football. She does not have an – I talked to her earlier today or texted with her. She does not have an open house tomorrow, but she will have one next week. If you're in the Austin area want to get by uh, and check out uh, the houses she has to offer, or if you need an agent in Austin or looking to list your house, moving from, to, or within, give her a call. 512-784-0505. That's 512-784-0505. Laura at AndyAllenTeam.com. She really is a good person and someone you can trust with your business uh, as well. All right, hey, Rod, I've got a question for you here. Let's do it. And this is a little bit, you know, going back to our previous conversation about finishing finishing a season strong and the way that we kind of expect Texas to maintain this you know, kind of national presence with the way that they're building rosters at the moment, that last game of the season every year, you know, that not only could have big implications for Texas for seeding, for clinching, but for a and as well, how, you know, the, the emotion, I guess, of that game is heightened exponentially no going into that game. But now that you have the opportunity to bump a team out of the top 12 or top 14 and maybe end their season earlier than expected, what it, what would that look like in a week of preparation on a short week of preparation going up against Texas A and M in a which you could end their season short of a college football playoff and vice versa? You know, I've always said when you play against rivals and they're rivals and marquee games, right? And sometimes rivals are your are marquee games. I, I tend to believe most coaching staffs are doing research and doing a lot of game planning in the offseason for those big marquee games. We know that from Sark and Alabama. Right. right, we know uh, we we can tell you that from the way they bounced back against Tuesday. They played Wyoming after that, <laughs> right? A lot of game planning and preparation, like the hype for those big marquee games. Um, so oftentimes, I don't really worry about the the players being ready to play for those games. You should be ready to play for that. I mean, Mac Brown when when he was recruiting us, he'd be like, you know, hey man, we got we got to beat the Aggies and we got to beat the Sooners. Got to beat A and M. We got to be Oklahoma. That's what it's coming to do. It's part of this. That's part of the deal. And because he knows, like, hey, if I lose at those schools, I ain't gonna have a job very long anyway. Yep. Right? That's like Michigan, Ohio State kind of stuff. Like, you losing to the Aggies and you losing to Oklahoma. Well, I mean, it really doesn't matter how you do against the other schools. At one point, the clock is ticking. Um, so he, he recruited guys like, hey, man, have that mindset when we're working out and when we're training. You know, those are his marquee games every year. Those are teams you got to beat every year. Um, back then, we weren't playing big time non conference games. I mean, your non conference games were against, and I'm not saying we, we, I think we lost a couple of those too. North Carolina State, Stanford shouldn't have lost those games, but they weren't necessarily against. They weren't marquee big time games. They weren't against blue blood institutions or anything like that. We just didn't come to play and underachieved in those games. And we had like five kicks blocked in North Carolina State game. Good lord, uh, changed football forever. By the way, on the forty acres, Mac Brown used to devote like. Uh, two periods to special teams before that. After that, it was like five periods devoted to special teams <laughs> and actually worked out. We became one of the best special teams programs in the country, but I digress. Um, so I, I don't worry about guys having a letdown for that, those big games. because Those are marquee games. I think coaches are kind of hyping up those games, even in the off season uh, about your rivals. Um, but yeah, now, you know, it's added. Now you got a new kind of added element of pressure to it um, because now, yeah, you can play spoiler to a team um, late in the season, especially with a lot more on the line. So I, I, you know, I, I think guys will rise to the occasion in that big game. I mean, you got a rival. Uh, it's a it's it's a game that's going to be hyped up. I mean, that Texas Texas A&M game will be bigger than Texas Oklahoma game for the first time that I can remember. Um, probably since I came on the Four Acres in 1999 was the last time Texas A&M was bigger than Texas Oklahoma. Ever since then, it's been Texas OU. Yeah, and I was coming off winning the Big Twelve title in '98. 
People don't remember that because y'all dog the Aggie so damn much. They just won the Big 12 title in 98. I came in 99. Hell, I decided between Texas and Texas and them. And them was the big dog in H-Town at the time, whether y'all want to believe it or not. That's the truth. And the Longhorns came in and then kind of just shifted the narrative really quickly in that regard. But in 99, that, that Texas and them, Texas was Texas, Texas and them was a bigger game than Texas, Oklahoma. And then Bob Stoops comes in, wins the national title in his second year. And then everybody looks at Mac Brown like, all right, you know what? That Heisman and those those nine wins ain't enough, brother. You need to you need to you need to pick it up. <laughs> and then that changes every that changes Texas Oklahoma into the marquee game because all the chips got pushed to the to the middle. And then oh, then A and M got kind of pushed to the back burner because I remember the tone turn the tone changing around. They weren't mentioning A and M as much after Stoops wins that national title and blows out Texas in the same year. We we didn't talk anything about the Aggies. I can tell you that right now. They they did go unfortunately to the back burner for us. It was like man, Oklahoma's the big dog, and now not only the big dog of this conference and our big dog rival, but they just they're the big dog in college football now. Oh, that's a game changer. Yeah. They yeah, yeah. AM fought AM fought through two uh through two coaching changes. Mm-hmm. Dennis Francione and Mike Sherman, neither of whom I Sherman left uh, Francione from a technical perspective and the option that he ran gave Texas some problems because Texas lacked speed at linebacker. They did. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. you remember that, Robert mm-hmm. Kilbert. I mean, I like Robert and all those guys, yeah. but they had they lacked true speed and that speed option. Gave Texas some true problems with Francione. Then they moved to Sherman. AM moved to Sherman, and he stockpiled talent on that team like nobody's O line. O line talent. But but just didn't have a penchant for play calling in in the clutch. That's what that's Mike Sherman. Mike Sherman, great coach, a uh, great program guy, did not have a great feel for play calling in the clutch. In my mm. And that that's why they ended up going to Kevin Sumlin. Yada yada yada, but um, you know the the that's why that that's another part of that reason why uh, Rod basically Mac Brown's success in Austin ran RC Slocum out of town or yeah. or to yeah. the bench whatever yeah. however you want to put it. Yeah. Hey, uh, we want to say thank you to a couple of uh, sponsors or not sponsors but to a super chat Edmund yeah. Lee. Thank you so much, buddy. Uh, yes, we we passed the thirty nine thousand subscriber mark. On all Texas football, that's one of the reasons why we're doing that this day. today. We want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, if you like this video, please uh, hit the subscribe button, like it, etc. It helps us uh, in untold ways. Uh, go to Ryan Nelson's next if y'all don't mind. Uh, Matt is uh, Matt Hutchinson, our uh, behind the scenes. Bobby, thoughts on a potential twenty-four team playoff? Whew. That's, a, that's a lot now. I mean, that's you got to win five games to win it all. Is that right or four? Division two has twenty in division two, basically like twenty four or some team, something like that. I don't know. I don't know that. It is. I think it is. I want to say it, it's 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 something like that. It's a bracket if, like twenty something team. If teams. you did that, you would have to stop conference championship. Yeah, too many right? games. Yeah, I mean, then you're talking about you're talking about an eighteen potential eighteen game season for college players. Now, if they're paid, Rod. Uh huh. <laughs> you know, if, if they're paid, uh, uh, do it. Yeah, twenty eight teams. Twenty eight teams. The for, tournament for division two division two football championship. The tournament field sub- subsequently has been expanded three times to sixteen teams in nineteen eighty eight, twenty four teams in 04, and twenty eight teams in twenty sixteen. Says here. Wow. So they hey, you got a model in front of you. To hell with it. Just do it. Just go. You do- you do that though. Do you just completely take away the value of the regular season? I mean that that starts diminishing the value of the regular season because I do not think twenty eight teams is a lot or twenty twenty four whatever the number is. I want the regular season to mean something still. Yeah, and absolutely. One thing it, the NFL is is great with parity, right? So how many teams make the playoffs? Twelve out of thirty? Is that right? I they expanded it. It's now yeah, fourteen. So it's, it's fourteen. 14. So yeah, half 14. the team, but half the teams are good is the difference. 50 teams in college football are not good teams. Nice. I wouldn't say 28 teams in college football, Division One are, are good. Hmm. I, yeah. I, I don't see 
it's like some of the the 65th team in some of these basketball tournament in this basketball tournament they get beat by 35 points that's not a game yeah that's, hey, that's a point. you don't want to see that then you start diminishing the idea of what a championship means mm-hmm. while yeah. also taking away the value uh, of it i can see it going as high as 16 and being okay with that any more than that i just think you're i think you're i think you're overdoing it Bobby, do you think we'll see a reverse of course for SEC coaches, administrations to keep, you know, a eight team conference schedule rather than move to a nine? The the way that you look at it, three, you know, you you schedule your one marquee game, you throw a team in, you know, the middle of November for you know a a, a makeshift buy. Uh, is that a, a way that you can kind of load manage your roster with the expanded playoff or is it, Hey, the money's going to run everything, get that extra conference game in there and let's keep these ratings high as a result. And, you know, if you make it, you make it, you good, you don't end the season, move on to the next. It, you look at Texas schedule right now, Colorado state, Michigan, uh, UTSA and uh, U- uh, Louisiana Monroe, you know, that's an extra non-conference game right now that you can kind of schedule and say, all right, you know what? We don't need to be playing Quinn Ewers and C.J. Baxter and Jaden Blue 80 snaps this week in compared to maybe an extra Iowa State or Kansas State that you would have had in the, in the Big 12. Well, your point is, if those four games, right, it's it's at least, a what, an 85% chance Texas wins at least three of them? 95% Texas wins at least three of them? So that's really what you're talking about. Whereas if you add another SEC team, say you add – Let's not even add an LSU. Let's add South Carolina. Sure. Okay. Not a great team uh, by any stretch, but a capable team. Yeah. I mean, they've had number one picks. Spencer Rattler is going to play in the NFL. He's not a great quarterback, but can be dicey at times if you don't play him right. Got some good receivers. Good receivers. That changes that dynamic. And that's what you're getting at. And I, I think coaches might like the eight-game conference schedule. I think that the administrators like the nine-game in part because of what it does to their season ticket sales. Yes. and I mean, look, if you all seen Texas's home schedule, if you're not excited about Texas's home schedule this year as a season ticket person, mm-hmm. you're nuts. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's some value there right now. I mean, you get to see Florida, Georgia. You know, you're, you're going <laughs> to – those are good teams uh, and, and uh, much better than what we've seen historically over la- since A&M really left the Big 12 and took and Nebraska left and all those. We haven't had good home schedules because OU game's always in Dallas. Yeah, you that's know? a good point. So, I think they, they want the nine games for the home schedules. I don't know that long-term that makes sense because I think you're going to have a better chance to argue for four teams in a 12 or 14 team playoff if you have that extra freebie. If exactly. you have four, if you have four SEC teams that are sitting at 10 and 2 or better, those all four of those guys are getting in. If one of them's 9 and 3, an 11 and 1 Arizona is going to be griping. Yeah, I was I guess that was where this next, you know, conversation was going to go is <laughs> At what point do other conferences get upset at this? And uh, like you said, Bobby, that last point with the SEC's kind of reputation over the last couple of years of, you know, boosting records as a result of playing an extra non-conference game, that could be a problem for other conferences to worry about or whoever the ultimate governing body of college football playoff comes in, if we ever see that. Uh, But this has been fun. Um, and it's going to get more fun in three days because, like you said, Bobby, we're going to be down there in Austin. We're going to be checking out spring football. The season's kicking off. You know, it's time for the pads to get back, put back on the Denny's Fields, the turf to be beat up just a little bit. And we're really getting close. You know, about 72 hours, a little bit less than that. We will be out there providing some updates, getting a, lo- a little look because, again, there is a lot of expectation, a lot of excitement. And as Jerry's been saying, it's the an- anticipatory. Uh, approach to this offseason is going to be very exciting to your point for texas to make the college football playoff is there a one single topic or a one single part of this team that you're going to be looking at and say you know if they can figure this out in spring i feel good about texas being a top 12 top 14 team when it's all said and done in 2024 
Um, you know what? That, first of all, I want to because talking about the college football playoff, the reason that it's important, even talking about moving forward and going back and kind of looking at the history and what would have been for Texas if the college football playoff had been, um, you know, had been a factor when Mac Brown was here, because now the standard for the Blue Bloods changes. Right. The standard was always, you know, can you get to double digit wins and then playing a BCS game when it was a BCS game or a New Year's Six, right. whatever. Now your standard now for your blue bloods is like, all right, now for Sark, it's like, well, I need you to make the playoff now because that means what you're but one of the best four teams in the SEC, essentially. One of the best, whatever it may be, best three, three, four teams in the SEC. Sorry, go ahead, Bob. 21 million. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> Great point. Yeah. Even more so, Bobby. Yes. Yeah. The, the money talks. But yeah, like now, you know, Mac Brown standard, we were, you know, I remember I, I remember saying that Mac Brown was a prisoner of his own excellence at one point. The 10 wins wasn't enough. It was like 10 wins was like, man, nobody gives up to 10 wins. We need you to beat Oklahoma, get 10 wins, and get to a BCS game. So long and fans kept pushing the standard of what it was supposed to be. Mac Brown became a prisoner of excellence. Same thing with Sark. Now the I think the, the standard's gonna be all right. I need you to make that college football playoff. If you didn't make the playoffs, then a lot of fans will look at that as that's a disappointing year. So you ain't even got to win the SEC like you used to, though. I mean, you just have to win the conference. Now you ain't got to win the conference. Can you make the playoffs? Make the playoffs like, all right, now we got a shot. So that's what I love about now. Conversation, the discourse is going to shift because the standard now for all of these blue bus, all of these coaches, now it changes. Can you make the playoffs? Especially for the, the big conferences. Obviously, the, we're talking about the power four, I guess we're talking about now. Uh, power two with two others. Power two. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're right, Rod. It defines it. Yeah. There's a definitive level for the first time in college football, maybe, maybe a defined level of what would mean success. Now, people may say, well, no, I want a championship. The, the su real success is I want to play for the championship, et cetera. Maybe. But at least it, it better defines it than when Mac was around, where yep. playing in a BCS was limited sometimes because you lost to Oklahoma, frankly. Period. And they were they were the big man on on the big man on campus in the Big 12 at that time. Um, I, the other thing that uh, we had, UT boy had this question or oh. comment that Colt did not have an offensive line at all. He didn't have one in 09 either. And Say it loud for the people in the back. Yeah. Say it. Truth. Yeah. I mean, That's true. I, talk, I talked to, to several, I mean, the good play, good guys, all of that stuff, but 09, I mean, they, they could not run the ball very well. And it was, it literally was uh, Colt throwing it to Jordan and, a little bit to, to Marquise Goodwin. I mean, that, that is basically what amounted. And they got to the national championship because Will Muschamp had a whale of a defense. Ooh, yeah. top five. They, defense, had, yeah. they had guys coming out the coming out there, Lamar Houston, Sergio Kendall. I mean, that you name it. There were NFL players all over that defense. Uh, so, yes, I agree. Not, not only 07, UT boy, 09 uh, yeah. as well. Give so, Cole credit. I agree with that. I, my, my one position, you know, you say, what? what's that one thing, uh, CJ, you ask? It's always going to be quarterback and their, that person's ability to take that next step. But, I, look, if Texas's offensive line is as good as advertised in the, big, in the SEC as they move to the SEC, that's going to open up a lot of things for Texas. Definitely. Definitely. And – I don't, but I don't know that we'll know that in spring is my problem, given what we know of Texas's defensive front. So I would say this, as opposed to the Texas offensive line, what I want to see in, in the spring is not only Ewers and his rapport that he builds with the wide receivers. I want to see if Trey Moore is a dude. Mm -hmm. Because if you add a legit pass rusher, like a legit pass rusher to this defense, the 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 calculus changes. You you I mean every, if you got if you add somebody that can make game changing plays, Anthony Hill changed the ca calculus last year a little bit. Mm. Not a mu not much because he's only a true freshman, right, Rod? Yep. But just enough. Yeah. Is is Trey Moore that guy? Is is Colin Simmons? Is Derek Williams now that he's a second year guy? So I, I'm looking at Edge and saying. I think they could be a, a strength of this team, and I want to see how bad they get after the quarterback. Obviously, they can't tackle the quarterback. There's plenty of one-on-one -on -one drills. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm looking at edge kind of with a 
a different eye right now simply because of what I've been told about Trey Moore behind the scenes. Well, that's exciting. That's yeah. a if Texas can add that, you know, Joseph Asai or Charles Minihue to a defense, Ooh. that Ooh. that would that would the great play the NFL dudes. I mean, that's that's, that's Rod knows what we're talking about. I mean, you're talking yeah. about a that Texas has not had that guy. Right. In yeah. Several- yeah, Joseph Osai, that's a good one, CJ. He was the last one, a force multiplier coming off the edge for you. Um, yeah, spring football is weird because anytime you get the reports about one position doing well or a player doing well, you automatically go, at least I do, I'm a glass half empty kind of person sometimes. I'm like, so so if the wide receivers are killing it, that means the DBs are not. <laughs> so I'm always yeah. Spring Rod, if you're, if you're pulling away with some interceptions, that must mean we got a quarterback issue. And that, <laughs> yeah. that, that's the case, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. Every every glass half full report, I'm like, well, then that means somebody on the team is struggling. If the O line's playing well, then the D line's not playing well. So I always have to, you know, balance it out with that. But getting back to the O line, I'll say this is we're we're jumping back in time, right? Today and doing a lot of uh kind of kind of you know different um we're doing different like time hopping from different eras of Texas football and comparing them. You know, Texas football was able to to still produce high level athletes, NFL draftable prospects um, at every position and compete at a high level um, with every position still, I think thriving, not thriving, but doing really well. The O line was like the first sign of the deterioration of Texas football for Matt. It was, it really was because I mean, quarterback was still, cause Matt Colt was still killing it. Colt was the man and going back to the comment from UT boy, you know, Cole was still kid. Wide receiver was still. I mean, Jordan Shipley and Quan Cosby, they were still great. Uh, actually, I take that back. It might have been O line and tight end. <laughs> it might have been those two actually, because you know, even even running back, you still. Had, I mean, Fozzie Whitaker was in the backfield. You still producing in guys that could play at the next level at running back. Uh, and, and, and on defense, I think we all agree. Defense, you know, linebacker, cornerback, D line, you're still producing high level players and playing really good defense, uh, way after even the decline of Mac Brown, Texas football. But the O line and tight end, which are very closely linked, even Sark says that the tight end position is his second most important position in his offense behind quarterback. That was kind of the first sign, and we didn't at the time. We just thought that's an outlier. Mac, Mac, Mac's got to figure out the old line recruitment. He's got to figure that out, and he never really figured it out. And then everything else kind of the deterioration and the decline of the old line. Everything else followed that, right? Then the quarterback position started to decline, and then what happened to the wide receivers? That started to decline. And everything else. Then we went to then that's the offensive identity crisis on the forty acres because in the play calling, you started to switch over play callers all the time, and you couldn't decide what you wanted to be offensively. You didn't want to be a, a ground and pound offense after you lost Alabama, and then we switched to being uh, more of a, a pro style offense, and then you went to all these different you know hybrid offenses. They never really figured it out. That's the identity crisis. So that I'll, I'll give Sark credit. I don't think Sark will ever have to worry about that. Sark prioritizes O-line play with big humans. He prioritizes quarterback, and he's able to recruit those two. And those are the two positions, I think, that started and inevitably really signaled uh, the decline of Mac Brown, Texas football. Most notably, the quarterback. Everybody remembers that. But the O-line might have come first. He might have started ignoring that O-line before he did any other position. I, I think agree. David Ash would agree with you. And kind of David Ash, Garrett Gilbert. Yeah, yes. I mean, it, wasn't, it wasn't just. It wasn't just. I mean, look. I here's another thing that uh, would would talk to you about uh, Rod that that would be good for you to to look at. You mentioned Fozzie, and I agree with you. Fozzie was a good running back. Malcolm Brown, good Malcolm running back. Malcolm Brown, yeah. But they, the the one of the chinks in the armor that you talked about, the first things that you saw out of that, they took three running backs in one class. None of them played. Jeremy Hills, the good, still around the team today. Oh yeah, Jay Monroe, um, and then Trey Newton. Oh, they took three yeah. running backs in one class. None of them were great running backs. Yeah, Got good play. I mean, I'm good, proud Longhorns, all of them. Yeah. That that showed a sign. You're going. You're getting away from a Jamal Charles, a Cedric Benson, that's true. Ricky Williams, where you had that run of dude, dude. I mean, Selvin Young was in that play, rushed for a thousand yards in the NFL. You, yeah, you that started dropping off too. Um, not to mention quarterback play, obviously, where you had mm-hmm. guys that were freaks back to back in VY and Colt, in my opinion. What was that uh, super chat we had 
uh, there, Matt, if you don't mind. Yeah. One, one last super chat here from UT boy. It's a good one. The most underrated team in history is 2008. In his opinion, that team would have beat Tebow pretty badly. Uh, hey, yeah. I have better defense than OU. That's for sure. We talked about uh, my shirt collection of the past. You know, some of those vintage shirts. The one <laughs> shirt I regret never having was 4535 in the burnt orange Ooh. letters across the chest. Because yeah. I, I would go to school, you know, middle school, high school every day, whatever, however old I was back then. I guess I was maybe fourth grade, but 4535 was what I was chanting every single day in terms of <laughs> that, that kind of carousel of Texas Tech, Texas, and Oklahoma, and who should have been uh, that, that team going up against Florida. I think that's a great point because that team was tremendous looking back on it. And now, I mean, the way that we're going through, you know, that, that, that 2000s to, mm -hmm. to, to today, basically, that 2008 team was robbed yep. of having an opportunity to play for a national championship. It's, it's the second best team, arguably, since Mac Brown came on the 40 acres. You I, could argue. No, no. I, I think it was better than 2019, no doubt. Exactly. I was like, you can argue um, it's 905 is the second best team. You can make that argument. Let me say this. The defense was better, had gotten better actually late in the year. That 2018, because Earl Thomas, remember, was in his first year as a starter. Mm -hmm. And they, even though they gave up 39 in Lubbock to freaking Michael Crabtree oh. and Graham Harrell, the last three games, 45-21, 35-7, 49-9. And then Ohio State, they beat Ohio State in the FES to 24-21. I was at, at that game. They had held Ohio State to 14 until the fourth quarter with a minute left when Ohio State scored. Damn. That defense had kind of galvanized a little bit. Sergio yeah. Kendall had really come on. Rack All those guys, yeah. Um, Loaded. So I, I don't think there's any doubt it's the second-best team and this Texas football last 25 years, I yeah, much better than 2009 because they they also had more talent at, at receiver. You know, yeah. Quan left the next year, mm -hmm. and Brandon Collins didn't return. So, right. oh, wait, you know what I mean? Yeah, about that. That's so, a good yeah. point. Hey, uh, luckily, I think we can all agree right now this 2024 team, at least what we expect to happen, will be the second best team at the very worst in the Steve Sarkeesian era. Oh, at okay. least. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I, I, I was talking about Steve Sarkeesian's era here. I'm, I'm not, not that crazy yet. That was nice. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the, the, the fingers were typing at home uh, for everybody in the chat there as well. But we, again, we get a nice little taste of that. All the updates will be coming not only here on the, on the YouTube channel, but on TexasFootball.com. Uh, it's starting off Tuesday, Wednesday is the pro day. So we're, we're really getting up there. Uh, yep. Bobby, we're, we've been going about an hour here. Is there anything yeah. else you want to touch on real quick? Thank you. to well, thanks, Baker for for, thanks for everybody. I hope you guys enjoyed a special Sunday or Saturday afternoon chat. We decided we want to do something special for the 39,000 uh, subscriber mark. And then also uh, we're just excited about spring football coming. I mean, okay. frankly, that's, that's big time uh, for us. Jerry's out in uh, Phoenix right now. Uh, I think he's going to a track meet today. I'm not, actually, I don't think he's going to the track meet. He was going to go to a track meet and go watch Phoenix area high school track, but I think he's actually wow. going to a Coyotes game with his son. Good. Good. It's Good. There you go. <laughs> yeah, hopefully he has some fun out there uh, and, and has a little fun. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with more. Uh, I do want to say uh, also thank you to Laura Baker and her, her sponsorship. And I also want to answer Patrick Page real quick. Uh, about Big Sean Rogers and his interview. Uh, thanks for that. He's a great guy. I uh, really appreciated him coming on earlier this week. If you missed that interview, uh, awesome. it's on the show or it's on the uh, YouTube channel as well as uh, podcast, wherever you listen to it uh, as well. Do us a favor, like the channel, like the show. Uh, leave us a review if you would, if you're on podcast as well. Uh, for Rod Babers, <laughs> look at Jerry Hamilton. Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> you're the sun devil there you go nice. forks up guys forks up there yeah. we go all right for jerry or for jerry he's who's with us virtually matt hutchison our producer rod babers cj vogel cj thanks for hosting uh y'all take care guys hook them yeah happy saturday happy saturday